Welcome to Grants Rock Warehouse, and tonight I want to welcome Jon Snow to the channel. Tonight we are looking at the band The Alarm. We're doing a career retrospective, checking out those IRS albums. So this is a great discussion. John's a great guy. Let's let's get this started. Grant is changing the world one track at a time on Grant's Rock Warehouse. Welcome to Grant's Rock Warehouse, and tonight I want to welcome John Snow to the channel. Tonight we are looking at the band The Alarm. We are going to look at the IRS year. So we're talking they formed in 1981. And the, the career expands to like 1991. We're not looking at any of those releases that came later. We're looking at that golden period of the band. So John is here. We are ready just to talk some uh, alarm. It's going to be great. Who was talking the alarm, John? <laughs> we are. Right? We are. <laughs> yes. So the whole premise of this show is to uh, talk about the albums, what we like, what we don't like. We're going to rank them at the end. And it's really just about turning you on to the band because they're probably one of those bands. Well, they are one of those bands no one talks about. Right. And really, people should be more aware of the alarm than they are. So anyway, John Snow, welcome to the show. How are you? I'm wonderful, Grant. How are you? Excellent. I'm good. Thanks for having me. You, it's always good. What was the, uh, wait a minute. Now you were, what, what did we do the last time? Was that Billy? We I did the now? producers. Producers. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we had Schnee on that one. That yeah. was a good show. I, I love the producers. So that the was producers fun. top yeah. notch. Yeah. If you haven't seen that, ladies and gentlemen, check it out below. Also in the links, uh, John has a, a YouTube channel and he does. Uh, well, he has a website as well. Check that out too. I'll put the link down below. Uh, please like subscribe to his channel. It's all about talking music, so uh, check that out while you're here. So anyway, John, let's get started. Um, all right. The I alarm. The alarm. Yes. Ah. So you can start it or I can start it. So it was back about 83, I guess, when I discovered the alarm. But it was thanks to my brother. Oh. And my brother, he had, you know, he would get all these albums. He introduced me to Def Leppard on their very first album. You know, bands like that. And then one day I saw the debut album, The Alarm, uh, Declaration. And I was just fascinated with it. So I popped it on, played it, and then boom, I was pretty much hooked from then on. Now, of course, he had the debut album, but he didn't have the EP that came out before that. So in June of 1983, we get the Alarm EP. And that's the back. It's just five songs. Mm -hmm. Still got a sticker up there. I'm afraid to take it off and ruin my cover. I hate when they do that. <laughs> uh, I, it's just better off to leave them. Now, some of the purists may disagree with that, but I'd rather just leave it and not screw it up. But you're yeah, right. And, and the sad thing is it's not a old one. It's one from a few years back when I found this one. Oh, really? So, okay. Yeah. yeah. And uh, But there's five songs on it. And two of the songs on here, I think, are just too classic classic alarm songs and their opening track is the stand um i didn't hear that one until i got the greatest hits album because that one's not on any of the albums it's only on the ep and wow i was just i mean mike peter's voice the the style of the music uh it's a real twangy guitar but i would I'm trying to think how do you describe them they were compared to like u2 and the clash when they first started those were kind of the two biggest comparisons they had. They're really not that much more like, I don't think they're like the clash that much. They have that political side to them mm -hmm. and a little angst, but not to that. They were more on the U2 kind of style, I guess. It's kind of where they, that's probably why they never really made it huge because they were a lot like U2. They're just the style and but, the sound. But we're um, also talking, well, they had the well. They had the debut single "In Safe Building" that came out in eighty one. The stand came out in eighty three. Yep. YouTube first U two album. What is that? Nineteen eighty. Because we think, by eighty three we together had back we then. had war already by eighty three. Yeah. Yeah, I can see that. Maybe they were a little bit in competition. Maybe not really in competition. Right. But it is very similar, and I do agree with you one hundred percent that I think it's more youtube than the clash but it's like a 
kind of like a combination. So if anybody's looking to get into this band, I think that's a good analogy. I think that's a good comparison, kind of like yeah. a little bit of both. And I'll, I'll tell you the difference between you two and the alarm. You two comes across as self-righteous and the alarm is more endearing. And they're like, you know, mm -hmm. I think they're more relatable than maybe you two. I always looked at them like, as like a working class band. Um, and so, and if you look, I mean, the style on the back for these first couple albums, yeah, they got the, you know, the drum, the, like the military type drum, their outfits are kind of Western. And then the picture on the debut album, we'll get to that in a second. It's more of that, you know, very old school, like old country, old Western kind of thing. And they're not country at all. Right. It's just style. Uh, and then the hair. Well, the hair's not bad on that one. We'll get to the hair in a second. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get to the hair in a second. Okay, cool. Um, it's all good. So, and then on this one, "Marching On" was another big song on it, and that ended up being on the next album. Um, but which, uh, you... that EP though really made a impression with like a lot of radio DJs and fans when that was released, because the stand as a track. Kill, that's one of the tracks that you still okay we have an alter well we used to they closed down we used to have an alternative station in columbus right. they would always play the stand it was like one of those tracks that kind of stood the test of time and it really it really it does. does it's really yeah. a great track yeah. and they still played it but why they closed down that's a whole other story yeah. but it was one of those tracks a standout track from the band i guess that's what i'm trying to say it definitely is it, it's it is probably still one of the best songs that they've ever done it's great and to come out of the gate swinging like that is pretty good well that ep we're not talking about the ep but we might as well i think the production's great yeah. i think the songwriting is great i mean think about it you've got an ep this strong no wonder djs and fans and people took notice of this band because it's yeah. very uh well it's great songwriting good production it checks all my boxes <laughs> well, well i mean and their irs label so yeah. let's talk about that for a second because irs label they're always to me had like these cutting edge mm -hmm. bands i mean rem if i'm not mistaken was irs mm -hmm. and so bands like that so the minute i see an irs label i'm always intrigued i'm like okay this is probably really good uh and it took me a while you know i was young at this point when this album came out it was probably a few years later i was anything i saw with an irs label i would grab because uh, right. they did have some great great bands miles copeland he knew what he was doing he did <laughs> So we'll go to the the debut, I guess. Oh yeah, we might as well jump to that. So that came out in 1984. Go ahead, okay. take it away. Well, I'll, I'll yeah, so we got a declaration, and you can see they got the, the this the crazy crazy hair. All their they hair looks look like, like members of the Cure. Yeah, and, but it looks like they stuck their a fork in the socket, and their hair just went boom. So, but that is nothing about what the the music is. Uh, an interesting fact on it, it's produced by Alan Shacklock. And I think that pronounced that right. Yeah, Alan Shacklock. Uh, and if you know who he is, mm -hmm. he is one of the members and writers for Babe Ruth from the 70s. I love okay. this album. And so I thought I'd pull it out and say, all right, the producer of their album, this is where he got his start early on oh, in Babe Ruth cool. in the 70s. So I did not know that. Yeah. See here, I, ladies and gentlemen, I'm learning something every day on this channel. Yeah. I saw his name and I was like, wait a second. I know that name. And I Googled him. And when I saw it was Babe Ruth, I was like, that's it. Cause that is, that's one of my favorite early seventies albums. I love that one. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, but anyway, um, the band itself, we've never really mentioned it is Mike Peters on vocals. Uh, it's, uh, Dave Sharp on guitar. Eddie McDonald on bass and Nigel Buckle, Nigel Twist, depending on when we came in, he's the drummer. And they stayed as a band through their high, the entire IRS time frame. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that in itself is awesome because it doesn't always happen. You get 10 plus years 
with the band. So, uh, you know, you have to admit that doesn't happen to a lot of bands. That's a right. good run. That know? is a good run. I mean, granted, it was sadly it was only five albums, but not a bad set of five albums. Correct. Um, so, trying to think, there's so much I like about this album. This is the well, album that my brother had, mm -hmm. and um, I re just remember dropping the needle on it. What I loved about them is there are just so many anthemic songs, and dang, they can write an anthem. 68 Guns, I mean, that's a song out there that just makes you want to get out there and fight. Um, it's just fantastic. Well, um, that's kind of... Mike, that's kind of what I wrote down. It's very anthemic. It's very inspirational. Yeah. Um, but for anybody looking to get into it, it's almost like, uh, how, I know we mentioned you 2 we mentioned uh, The Clash, but I think that's still a good analogy because it it is kind of like a, you know, people put The Clash in that whole punk rock Right. category i mean they're the clash were never punk rock like the sex pistols were no no <laughs> but it's kind of like i guess you could still put it in that genre kind of alternative when you're thinking of alternative music in the the 90s because alternative really didn't exist yet right. but i guess college rock radio college that's... rock yeah i mean i would put these guys in new way because think about and it and they are but I... yeah before that's still within that. And look at them on the cover. If those don't look, if those gentlemen don't look new wave, I don't know who does. Exactly. <laughs> Looks like Lords of the New Church or something. Yeah. You're right. They really do. I, right. I, yeah. I would, I would say that. But, but Bob Dylan is a big influence on them too. There's a lot of harmonica. Really? Mm -hmm. uh, I just hear Dylan in a couple songs. Okay. And especially when that harmonica comes in. Because there's a folksiness to a lot of their songs. I mean, it's rock, but I don't know. There's just depth to the lyrics. Uh, they they have something to say. This album, compared to the next one, is a little different. This one's a little more upbeat, a little happier, like Marching On. I, I even said something like Jangly Pop a little bit, um, if yeah. that's a a way to do well say. or i wouldn't say well i don't know if you no, can no. use the word power pop but more like yeah it's sort of jangly like that rick and backer yeah. 12 string kind of sound i get yeah. it yeah yeah uh and then you got where were you hiding when the storm broke i mean just some great melodic songs um i mean there's not a there's not a bad song on the album in my opinion um i don't know how you feel about that but, i uh, think I yeah. think it's well. I haven't ranked them yet. I'm just gonna let it go. But uh, yeah, yeah. Since this I won't is the first much. debut. You know, you have every all your whole life to make that debut album, and I think that this album really hits hits it home. Uh, I mean, yeah, mix of punk, alternative, I guess. Uh, but it's very the choruses on this record. Man, yeah. Can these guys write a hook? I mean, it's and right. The, the, yeah. And his vocals, mm -hmm. Peter's vocals. I mean, there's a little grit to him and it's just enough. Well, it brings it to life a little bit more. Um, but I mean, it, you know, it's anthemic. It, it's great. Social. It has socially relevant lyrics. It's, yeah. it's a very strong debut. It really, it, encapsulates the spirit of the 80s as far as i'm concerned it's not a downer of a record it's really like you said it's anthemic yeah. um tracks that i think's great i think uh 68 okay what i wrote down 68 guns an, an anthem you know youthful rebellion oh, on this uh great chorus great driving rhythm it's a great one where were you hiding when the storm broke how do i even put it it's just catchy great it songwriting it's it's a bit political a bit, <laughs> bit uh socially conscientious just a, little. <laughs> just a little bit yeah uh but still that doesn't take anything away for it. it's very catchy very uh, accessible the stand of course inspired by the stephen king novel it's oh, great yeah. 
And yeah. I've already talked about the stand, but it's absolutely brilliant. That's yeah. probably my favorite track from them. I mean, it's anthemic. It's phenomenal. So yeah, I like Not this much. album quite a bit. I can tell. Ask. <laughs> I like it. It's. I think it's great. Yeah. All right. For me, we'll mm -hmm. we'll go to the next one. Mm -hmm. The next one came out. I don't know the date. It came out in eighty five. Eighty five. I'm not sure what what date it came out. A date. Here's the the mm -hmm. strength or strength, and they they pulled back on the hair a little bit, except for this one guy over here. Um, he's he's still he still looks like a member of the Cure. Yeah. But, uh, I luckily still have the nice insert still in there. So, um, this album, I went out and bought this one. So my brother. Yeah introduced me to the debut and then i was so hooked the minute this thing came out i was all over it and of course i could only afford a cassette back then um i probably couldn't have done i probably didn't have a turntable and stuff so all my stuff back then would have been cassettes but now it's all on vinyl uh same band um this one where the first album was a little more optimistic this one is a little more pessimistic mm -hmm. just when you listen to it, there's a little more, it's not a downer album musically. It's yeah. just a little darker on the lyrics. Sometimes, um, uh, there's loneliness, um, just a whole bunch of things that are just not as happy as they were <laughs> on the last, last go round. But as far as an anth anthems, it's loaded with them as well. Uh, from the, the song strength the title song um i mean actually that one did chart in the u.s at number 61 um back in that day um spirit of 76 was another one Classic. i mean oh, just that one's great uh, my favorite song they've ever done is on this album and that one is the day the ravens left the tower because that one, I was like, what was going on with that story? So I looked it up, and it's kind of about the fact that in the Tower of London, there are these ravens that live. Mm -hmm. And the theory is, if the ravens ever leave, the the, mon the, the, the monarch will fall, and the country will fall. So it, to me, that was just fascinating. Uh, his vo vocals on that song, it's just a haunting, haunting song at times. Um and it is probably, like I said, it is probably my favorite song they've ever done. Uh, and like the first album, there's not a bad song on here. I mean, heck, Knife Edge is probably another one I forgot to say. That one is just as good. Oh, I wrote that down, too. So yeah. you mentioned everything that I had written down. Well, those are key tracks, I think. I They're think key tracks. Key yeah. tracks, yeah. Uh, and then another one, I, there's the, the two. This is one of those albums where it's a solid album from the front to the back. Mm -hmm. There's something about the flow of the songs and the order of everything that makes this album just work and just feel perfect. I mean, even the last, usually get down to the, like the ninth and 10th song and they're crap. No, I mean, absolute reality, just unbelievably catchy. Uh, then the ballad walk forever by my side. Uh, I mean, I might as well just rattle off the rest of the names because they're all just really good songs. Well, I think you make a good point because if you're doing a sequencing on a record, you know, some of these records, like you mentioned, they kind of fall apart. But in all honesty, if you're sequencing a record, you want to start off strong, end side two strong, start side two, what did I say? Start side, side one <laughs> strong, end side one strong, start yeah. side two strong. It really end with the end of side two because you want to bring those listeners back. You right. want to bring, you're like going, oh my God, that was incredible. I can hardly wait for the next record. You are a hundred percent right. This album is sequenced perfectly. It makes you want the next record. I think it's. Yeah. I mean, heck, like it starts off with Knife Edge. Mm-hmm. End of side one, spirit of 76 opens with D side, even though it ends with more of a ballad, it is a phenomenal, phenomenal song. Yep. And so, yeah, you just want to flip it right back over. 
Mm -hmm. for me i just turn it back over and start again yeah i think that the big thing is i think that the songwriting on this record's really just as good as what came before this record's a little bit more polished now if you follow it in a lot of these bands that's kind of how things work yeah you no money on the first one (laughs) right you don't get any money but then they throw a little bit more money because it got good reviews people liked it and then by the time you get to that second album well, we can, uh, you know, work it a little bit harder. Now, I, just because it's a little bit more polished doesn't it's, take anything away from it, but it's a different album than the debut. Yes. There's a lot of things here that are very similar. You still got that social political thing, which is fine. Doesn't it's, take away from anything, but it just has a little bit smoother sound. It's a higher production, you know. Yeah, I mean, the guitars sound the same. I mean, you've yeah. got that same twangy tone whatever he does it's it's so high pitched i love it um so that sounds the same the vocals are just a little cleaner but he's still got the grit right um but it's not as polished as you know we'll get to that when When it gets down to it john it just depends upon what you like yeah 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 so all right all right well after that one there before we get to the next album i believe this one was came out afterwards yeah. It's called Electric Folklore Live. It is only what five songs? One, two, three, four. sorry, six songs. Uh, they're all live. Um, yeah, they're all, and it's just, they're all fantastic. I, I don't know. It might have come in after because Rain in the Summertime's on here. So maybe this came uh, after, or it was right before and they played it. I'd have to look it up. Yeah, but I have to look it up. I forgot to look this one up. It would make sense, though, because considering strength came out in 85 and the next album we're looking at either hurricane came out in 87 you would think that that would be like a i don't want to use the term oh, filler yeah but something just uh because think yeah. about it we're still in the 80s taking a no. two-year break during this time a lot of people could have forgotten you over that yeah. period and if they put out something like that it's still you know it, it would make sense but it, it, i did look it's this came out afterwards it, after yeah. Okay. I'm well, that's like either K87. So, and Folklore Live was well, 88. Okay. Now it makes more sense because, okay. With Rain yeah. in the Summertime on there, it was like, that makes more sense. I saw that and was like, wait a second. I got them out of order. And I love mine. Mine's a mine's a promo copy. It's got the gold stamp. So, does it have a white label? No, it's, I don't think it's that. No. I think that they kind of gave up on the white label promos by that time. Yeah. I this is just a gold. It's a black, but I love the. The insert mm-hmm. it's got um t-shirts and stuff you can order um on that uh but anyway it's a nice little thing i just got it out of order so i apologize no no <laughs> no big deal we're here just talking music <laughs> hey ladies and gentlemen we're keeping it real in the warehouse so. that's right i just got my you know my my glasses even with glasses i have trouble reading I understand. and it looked like a six and not an eight so you well know. i'm not wearing any mine so you're lucky i can even do this <laughs> all right all cool right. so all right so we just got out of 85 there's no ep no anything so we're gonna jump to uh i have a hurricane from 87 i have a hurricane god right. i remember seeing that record john's oh, or the cd of that so many times in the used bins back in the day yeah it's a, a lot of these you could get in the use and the vinyl back in the record store where I used to go, you know, okay, back in the 90s, I always talk about it when people were unloading their whole collections. Uh, you could get wish... all those alarm albums for a buck. Yeah. Now, now I don't know how much you're going for. You know, I mean, when I got these eight, nine years ago or whatever, mm-hmm. there were five bucks most that of That sounds them. about right. But I, I was looking up the greatest hits because I, I want that one. For some, I didn't realize I did not have that one. I was very upset about that. Mm-hmm. That one's going to cost me 10, 15 bucks. Okay. And then when we get to the last album, I only have it on CD. That one's a little more like maybe 20. Yeah, but we're can... talking raw 1991. 1991 was the cutoff. Yeah, they were starting. vinyl to... pressing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so it's a little rarer to get those. So it'll cost me a little more. All right. But anyway. I'm getting on a tangent there. No, we like tangents. What it's about. uh, This one's broken up into two sides called electric and folklore. Um, And I'll be honest, 
I think there was something they were trying to do, and I don't know exactly what it was because it's all electric. I mean, the whole album's electric. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe it's the themes of the last songs and stuff. Um, I just remember seeing the video for Rain in the Summertime, and I loved, loved that song. It's just, it's a great, catchy pop rock song. Um, this album, if you thought the other one was polished, this one has been wiped clean. This it's is pretty polished. This is more U2 than any of the other ones, in my opinion. It, because in 87, U2 had Joshua Tree, and that thing's polished. So, yeah, well, you kind of wonder. I'm throwing it out to you. Since we're just talking music, do you think that they just matured more in this record? Or do you think it's a product more of the time from 1987 where things just kind of got to that point where things were getting, well, you know, the 80s kind of got out of hand. They in did. my opinion yeah do you think it was just part of that or do you think they're just maturing and growing i'm just curious i kind of think it's more pressure from the label okay and the label wanting to push things to the next level mm -hmm. because they did i, I want to say that that strength did as good as declaration mm -hmm. but none of them did really anything better you know, much better than the other ones. Yeah, because um, none of these records really set the charts on fire at all. No, and it wasn't until their fourth album they actually got a top, not a top 40, but their highest charting song came there in the U.S. came from the fourth album. Yeah. Which surprises me, even though it is a fantastic song, and we'll get to that. But I just don't get it, because some of these songs are just so, so good. I mean, like Rain in the Summertime mm -hmm. is perfect. Now, it's 87. You had Def Leppard. You had White Snake. You had Aerosmith. But these guys aren't like Aerosmith or White. They're Snake. not. But those guys were ruling the radio at that time. Mm -hmm. So even though I did see Rain on the Summertime on MTV, I don't remember hearing it much on my local radio mm -hmm. uh, in in Atlanta. So, um, but there are a lot of good songs. There is one strange song on here. And it's not strange in the fact that it's a strange song. One Step Closer to Home was a live song, which I thought was a little bizarre on a studio album. But maybe they figured it's such a good song, it's such a good live version that they couldn't do it any better mm -hmm. in the studio. I don't know. But Dave Sharp was, the, was singing on it, hadn't sung on anything else up to that point that I'm aware of. Uh, so it was a real surprise. But it, it is a great song. Um, so I just thought it was a little weird. Throw it in as the fourth song. I could see it maybe at the end. Uh, yeah, maybe but, where they placed it just seems odd. But when you listen to it, does it stick out? Yeah. It does you can hear stick the crowd out. and everything. Yeah. You when you hear it, you're going, Oh, that doesn't seem right. Yeah, it should have been at the end. Yeah. I don't know but if it didn't seem right. I was just like, Whoa, Well, you what, know what, what I mean. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it kind of ruins the flow. It did. Yeah. It did. Um, a little bit. It kind of threw me uh, when I first heard it. Now I know it's coming. Um, but still, uh, there's another really good song on here, Rescue Me. I already said Rain in the Summertime, but Rescue yeah, Me. Write that down, too. Uh, they used that song on just a stupid fact on 21 Jump Street uh, back in the day. <laughs> um, that one hit number 34 on the mainstream. And then another song that was really great was Presence of Love. Um, and I really like Eye of the Hurricane, the final track on here. Mm -hmm. um, there's, just, there's just a lot of, there's a lot of good songs. They're not as gritty. They are, I don't know. I don't know if they're as, to me, I don't know if there might have been depth. I don't feel the depth in the songs, the lyrically stuff, as I did in the first two albums. Um, Rain in the Summertime doesn't really feel like, feels more like a love type song, uh, but it is good. It is really good. No, it's great. Yeah. It's very but, lush. Yeah. You know. That's a good word for it. But it yeah. is uplifting. Um, it is. Atmospheric. This is a different record than the other records. Yeah. Because this is, like you mentioned, this is way more polished than the records that came before. Now, yeah. whether you like that or not, I'm not. I'm just saying, uh, but, uh, 
it still takes those roots that they're made up of it, but it blends it a lot better with the sophisticated production. It's lush, but you know, whatever it fits kind of with those introspective lyrics. And I think it's a good record. It might not be someone else's cup of tea. If you like that first record, but these bands grow and they involve and evolve and they involve and they involve and they involve. (laughs) I told you words are hard. So. But I wrote down Rain in the Sunshine, great hit single, lush, reflective, atmospheric. I like it. I don't know why that's doing enough. Why do you do the thumbs down? <laughs> we'll do the thumbs up. Oh, we got that. Okay. Rescue Me. Yeah. Powerful ballad. Oh. Great. Oh, my God. So emotional. Yeah. Mike Peters' vocals on that are so emotional. It just brings you in and kind of takes you in. Highly recommend that to anyone looking at this. That's a highlight. Yeah. Um, the other one that you didn't mention, I'm going to mention one step closer to home. You know, you've got a sense of journey and then you return. It's anthemic. There's always anthemic. Always. Cracks on all these, uh, these alarm albums. It's part of their makeup. It's unbelievable, but it's got a lot of lyrical death depth and it i think it i don't know it reached out to me i think it's uh another one of those high uh tracks and with high standards i i I have no problem with it there's a lot of great stuff it's just a little bit different Different. the band is evolving yeah that's all yeah and oh i agree i agree and i do like what you said about mike peter's and that's one thing about his singing is he can get emotional. He can mm-hmm. make you feel those lyrics. It, it seems a lot of the times it does seem like it's personally affecting him, which a good singer can do that. Uh, so, but the thing is a, a, a singer at that level yeah, to be able to do that and grip the listener into it, yeah. bring the loose listener into the track. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> Not many can do that. I'm just saying. No, That's why no. we're looking at this catalog. Really, we're trying to turn you on to it. If you haven't checked out the alarm, you might might be right up your alley. So it might be. Yeah. So, all right. Then we jump two more years. And we go to 1989 in September with it's called Change. And it's a cutout die cut. Die cut. You have yeah. to like that. Yeah, I love that. You have to be really careful because it's a little messed up on these e the e right here. So I have to be. I don't keep the album inside it anymore. I just keep the the paper inside. Anyway, <laughs> um, this to me saw them. It still it saw them go a little bit back to their grit of the first two, but still it's still well produced. It still sounds great. But I felt this album a little more than I did the last one. Um, I, so yeah, I, that's kind of my big thing. They still do sound like you two. I'm gonna admit. Well, but you two morphed and changed too. I but I hear it though. It's still uh, that YouTube element is still part of their sound. So you can still hear you two in there. Yeah, and they did add a new member. Uh, Mark Taylor on keyboards. He'd never been listed before, uh, but he was on this one. Now, this has a ton of tracks. Uh, I want to say, let's see, what is this? At least 12. Uh, well, and normally they, that's not a ton, but. No, but, but think they, about it. Fun. Think about it, John. We're 1989. The yeah. CD era, they're going to try to pack on as many tracks as they can. And this is probably around that time when things started to, to uh, reflect that. I'm just saying, but it did. Yeah. Um, well, I guess my uh, the thing is you can pack it with more tracks instead of the regular nine. Do you think that uh, by packing it with 12, it took anything away from the material? No. How do you look at it? No, in this case, no, because some of the deeper cuts in here are some of my favorites mm-hmm. on here. Uh, side two, um, no frontiers, Scarlet. Oh, Scarlet. I love Scarlet. Um, even though it's a repetitive kind of course, just saying Scarlet is a rage. 
I'm probably misquoting. He says that a lot, but oh my gosh, his his vocals on that are just stellar. And it's just one of those deep cuts in there that for me just made this album that much better. Uh, now, the big hit on here is the uh, Sold Me Down the River. That was the highest charting song they had in the U.S. at number 50. It went to number two on mainstream rock charts. Uh, so it was their biggest hit. And it was not till their fourth album, which, like I said earlier, just surprises me. It took I, that long. Yeah, that blows me away that it took that long. Yeah, because I really thought Rain in the Summertime should have been like a top 40. Um, so yeah, so Sold Me Down the River, The Rock, uh, and then another one of my favorite ones. It's a little bluesy. It's the Dev Devolution Working Man Blues. Mm -hmm. And as I've always felt, is they felt like a working man kind of band, a working class kind of band. And this song is more proof of that for me. It has that feel too. Yeah. So whatever they're trying to convey, it comes across. It does have that working man blues aesthetic. It's yeah. what I would have. This is what I would have expected from the alarm with a title like this. I guess that's right. what I'm trying to say. Yeah. So it totally fits it. Yeah. Um. So yeah. Um. Trying to think. Now what? Um. David Sharp does not sing on this one. So it's like okay. Because I, I bring that up because something changes on the next one. <laughs> well, we get a lot of, well, we're getting some change. Um, well, of course we're getting change. Boom. Because um, of the damn title. Yeah, That's so. exactly right. Uh, but there's a little more keyboards, which is why they added the, the new player. Um, but they're not bad. They don't over, there's, I mean, sometimes I don't even really notice them. They're just there for texture and stuff. I don't, I don't, this, I don't really can't remember a keyboard song really. Mm -hmm. So it's still heavy guitars. That's still the main focus. Um, and just, I mean, to me, that's, I like the songwriting better on this one than I did the last one. So I think oh. they're evolving more, okay. um, uh, for me. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the change. Um, um well, this record I wrote down, Soul Me Down the River. You know, it's very bluesy, gritty. Yeah. Um, definitely a hit. Oh, come on. This is a hit when you yeah. hear it is. Great beat, powerful core of it, chorus. A lot of these alarm albums, a lot of these songs always have strong melody, great choruses, and that checks that box. If I'm listening to the alarm, Soul Me Down the River, I'm good. Uh, yeah. and you mentioned the evolution of the working man blues. Uh, that's a, the other track. I think that's a great track. It totally picks that vibe, you know, I mean, it reflects about the struggles of the working class, et cetera, et cetera. Good track. Uh, the other track that I wrote down in my notes, a new South Wales. Oh yeah. That's good. It's very dramatic. It's an orchestral piece, but it shows the band this is what's good. Now, whether you like it or not, I admire this because it shows the alarm stretching out a bit. Yeah. It kind of, it's not quite like what they did before, but you know, these bands, they put all of these records out and eventually you've got to, you get bored and I'm you not do. saying the four bored, but it, they're stretching out a bit. And I think it's a good, I think it's good. I don't have a problem with it. No, if you want to do a song or two like that, perfectly fine. Just don't dramatically do it on a whole album. <laughs> like, exactly. I, I like a gradual change as opposed to like something that's just like, okay, now we're going to do 180 degrees and we're going to do this. Yeah. So. But as we talked about before, this album is also polished. It is. Um, it's just the nature of the beast with these records as we go through the 80s. Um, this record sell anymore i would say it, no it did not it did not sell it out so yeah yeah that was the the problem they were running into with irs was that they were putting all this effort i mean writing great material sounding great sounding albums right even had a hit sort of at 50 Kinda. but they still couldn't sell more than the previous album they still couldn't sell more than the previous album for that so that's the struggle that they came up against. And then, of course, 
times were changing as well coming up soon. I mean, so yeah. I'm not trying to blame IRS for any of this, but do you remember back in the day? Because I don't remember. Do you remember how much of a push or how much marketing they gave the alarm back in those days? I don't remember any marketing for this. No, not for this. Uh, I'm, I was surprised this song, the song that they did get on the radio, got on the radio. Because I almost, I don't think I got this album when it came out. Um, mm -hmm. It was one of those that I just, I mean, 89, I was in college and a million other things on my mind. But I, yeah, I missed this when it originally yeah. came out. So it was a little bit later. So I would say, yeah, they didn't do much marketing. I just remember back in the day, it didn't take too long that people would buy it and then they would trade it in and you would see it in the cheapy bins. Now I don't see it at all anymore. It's like a rarity. But I, I you know, it was you would kind of see it back like on the college campuses and stuff. Yeah. And I'm not trying to talk bad about it. It's just the way it was. Right. But it really got no promotion. No one really cared at this time. Um it's really kind of a shame because yeah. they did put a lot of effort into this release and really was just kind of neglected, but yeah. it happens. It happens. It happens. And, and they did a, they released a greatest hits the year later standards. Mm -hmm. I don't have it. I'm sorry. I can't show it off, but that's an IRS release. Mm -hmm. I remember that one. I when do too. Out, I remember I bought it. Mm -hmm. So it's like, I get on there and I'm listening to it. I was going, what album is that song on? And that's when I discovered change. And I was like, oh, there was an album after I had a hurricane. <laughs> okay. So um, that's how I ended up going back and getting change is because I got the, I bought this. I actually bought the CD because this was 89. I was buying CDs then. So I yeah. got the CD for standards. I don't think that standards sold all that poorly. I mean, if you would go back in the wild back in the day and look through the bins, You'd see those, and I'm not saying that's good or bad, but you usually would see, for me, if I'm looking through the used bins, you'd see the greatest hits more than anything. Right. So I think it was fairly successful as opposed to the it, rest of the catalog to some degree, right. but that's greatest hits albums for you. So. Yes. And I'll admit this greatest hits is phenomenal. I mean, phenomenal. it has got all it's got the anthems it's got just the great songs so if anyone doesn't want us afraid to start with an album definitely get standards if you like that then go get the albums for sure yeah so, it's exactly what i'd recommend yeah it's great uh -huh. it's a good comp it songs flow yeah i don't really hear anything on it that i could do without um yeah i'd highly recommend it I'm just yeah Leave I think it's there. just it's missing two of my favorite songs, but my two favorite songs are deep cuts. They're not necessarily mm -hmm. the hits, the singles and stuff. So uh then we get to what 1991. Yep. Oh boy. Yes. Uh -oh, that not, doesn't sound good. No, not about the album, just about the whole situation. Oh, I think they were okay. having trouble with IRS. IRS was not real happy, things weren't selling. They did the greatest hits because they're trying to, I think, f get rid of the contract. And there was one album left on the contract. And that's how we get Raw. So I think Raw is a contract obligation album. Doesn't mean it's terrible. Um, it's just there's some differences on here. The producer of this album is The Alarm. Mm-hmm. And you know, if you look on Wikipedia, it does say the alarm. It, then it, is, it says Dave Sharp separately as well, which unless it says it inside, it just says the alarm on here. But it got me thinking, Dave Sharp sings three songs on this album. So if he's now somewhat the head producer of it with the band, it would explain why he has three songs on the album now and only having one on the previous four. So, so very, very different. Does that take away from the album or how do you, when you listen to it, are you good with Dave Sharp singing three songs? No, I'm not. Oh, you're not good. Oh, no, because okay. he's not a terrible singer by any means. I just, I don't find his vocals as comforting and as heartfelt or as, I don't know, the grit. That Mike Peters has, mm -hmm. I don't think Dave has that. 
I think it kind of takes away from the total sound of the band. Yeah. Because I think Mike's vocals, I mean, come on. It, I don't want to use the term iconic, but so it good. just seems to marry with the <laughs> the sound, the of, the sound of the band. When you hear his voice, you can instantly go, oh, that's the alarm. Yeah, right. absolutely. Uh, nothing against Dave. I mean, his, his no? fun, it's just... And, you know, if they had multiple singers from day one, mm -hmm. I don't think I'd have any kind of issue with it. I like bands that have multiple singers. But mm -hmm. when you've got one singer all the way up to this point, I'm sorry, I've always been a Mike Peters fan. So I, I'm in it for Mike Peters and the sound of the music. So it just, it threw me to hear those songs. He did, like I said, he did three of them. And then they also had a cover song on the album. They covered Rockin' in the Free World, Neil Young. See, that's... Well, and that, to me... Go we're ahead. talking... 90, and they're doing a cover that in 1991. Yeah. I think the Neil Young album came out in 89. Yeah, I was about to say, didn't that just come out a year or two earlier? Maybe. Yeah. I think it came out in 89. Yeah. And to me, it's, um, it's a safe choice, too. So it's like... I get it because it's a political song right. and they're, they do a lot of social and political commentary in their music, but yeah, it's a safe choice. Well, and this is the way I look at it and tell me if I'm full of crap or not. Okay. If you're at this point in your career, 1991, and you guys, you have a band that are all excellent, top notch yes. songwriters, look at the catalog and yep. you're in 1991 and you're going to throw in a, a cover that just to me, when you're at a band at this level, like the alarm is yeah. top notch, you're going to do a cover at this point in your career. That just means to me, it's just filler. You didn't yeah. have enough songs and we're talking 1991. There, there's a break. Yeah. We've had some lineup changes, but we're going 89 to 91 and you couldn't scrape together another song. Yeah. And I might be nitpicking. I'm not trying to nitpick. But it's a valid question. If it is. Why, why? Yeah. Well, yeah, because, I mean, and it's the same band. It's the same four guys. Mm -hmm. And then. Yeah, because actually we start, we get the lineup change later after this. Yeah, it's That's complete, when things complete. Yeah. 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 Oh, and then the other thing that le leads me to believe this was contract obligation is when the album came out, the band broke up. So I don't think they toured. I that think they were done. Was a contract obligation. Yeah. The band because they probably weren't going to get any support from IRS at that no. point. Yeah, you owe us yeah. another record. Put it out. Whatever. Yeah. But you know, think about it. It's not bad for a contract obligation record. Oh yeah, let's talk about good. I mean, the opening track raw, yeah. and it is that, and it is this album is a little Punky. more raw. Yeah. Goes back um, to the roots. It's raw. It's unfiltered. Yeah. It sounds like the alarm from back in the day. It and does. If you like that, you're probably going to dig this. Yeah. So. I like moments and time. It's I wrote a little, that down too. It's a little cheesy. It's a little, but it's very nostalgic and it's just, it's a good song. But I, sometimes I'm like, yeah, it's a little cheesy, but I'm like, ah, why do I like it? <laughs> well, it's very mature sounding. I think. See, you listen to these songs and you're going, this, this cannot be a, a, a contract album, but I mean, we're looking at the, the very best of the best, but moments right. in time and raw so far. Oh, and then uh, what else deeper in the down? album, the wind blows away my words and let the river run its course to my wrote favorite down songs. the road, you know, the portrayal of their life on tour. I mean, it's very heartfelt. I think it's a stand. Oh, I think it's good. That's on the uh, remaster. That's not on the original. Well, I have the. Well, okay. Well, yeah, that's which what is I've fine. Got. Yeah. No, the road's phenomenal. It's on the one like on iTunes. The mm -hmm. roads. The roads on it. Well, that's phenomenal. the one I heard. Yeah, phenomenal song. But, but as far as the original album, that one only came out on the remaster. But well, still, let me ask you this: Was that what was that originally on the, in their catalog? Uh, that, Is that one, like it was a B side on, or what outtake? It was on stand. It might have been on standards. Um, 
God, I'd have I don't have standards. I don't have standards either, so I don't have to look it up. But I know there were two new songs, uh, "Unsafe Building," which is not a new song, but it was not on any album. Mm -hmm. But they placed that on standards, and I want to say "The Road" was the the opening track. See, I wonder. You know, this could be like the Pretenders Two thing, where the 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 label wanted a record. The band wasn't ready, so the Pretenders put out that EP. Remember the EP? Mm -hmm. But two of the songs ended up on Pretenders 2. Okay. I don't know if it could be a similar situation. Yeah. I mean, I wasn't there. This is my theory. It sounds like that, because if they put the road on standards, I could totally see why they would put it on there. You've yeah. got to have something to grab people in well look this has a track that's not available on anything and you know mike peter probably thought well the road is such a great song we'll put it out on raw yeah great i think song. it fits right on it's great i had to mention it yeah no it is great and i remember when i was listening to the album on because sometimes i was listening to it in the car and i don't have a cd player so i had to stream it and road came on and i was like why does this feel wrong? I said, oh, who cares? Well, you're used to the, you're yeah, used I was to used to, I said, something's out of sequence. Uh, but I'm like, who cares? This phenomenal song. I'm going to listen to it. Um, but they did that. And that is one thing. If you go and try to get their stuff now, they mm -hmm. have all these remasters that they've added a ton of songs to. Uh, so you're, you're not like, I have all the basics. So my 10 song albums, now they're like 14, 16 tracks. Right. If you get, one of the remap re, the re-releases and stuff which i'm planning on since i have vinyl i'm planning on getting all the cds with all the extra tracks and stuff. yeah you might as well get them are those all in print right now i mean they still available no, they are um i know they're you know somewhat easy to get on discogs and on amazon but i don't know if they're actually still in print i'd have to you look. know what John? i didn't i can't imagine they would sell a lot and i'm not trying to no i can't band, imagine they would but... either it's like one of those bands, if they do like a reissue program, you might want to get it when you can get it. Because think about it. They might not sell a lot. They'll end up in the second hand market and they might want an arm and a leg for stuff. Yep. Sure. That's why you always should jump on stuff. But <laughs> I'm just saying, I'm just talking to the, the people. Yeah. Um, But the road, I could see it being on here. It's raw, it's honest, it's great. And like I said, it portrays that touring lifestyle. Kind of like, you know, Jackson Brown. Um, <laughs> moments in time I wrote down. Um, it, one thing I have noticed with this record, they do seem to be more mature. With each record, they mature. Now, I'm not saying that's good or bad. Right. But if you're... Uh, a listener i mean moments in time for me I, I i seem to connect to it yeah you know it seems like they're how do it's i very want to nostalgic song it's very nostalgic but it's almost like they're focusing the track on you you feel like you're part of it and at least that's what i felt on that song yeah and then uh well we talked about raw but it's very punky raw yeah, yeah. it's like the old days a lot Looking of passion roots yeah. A lot of energy. Hey, yeah. it works. I think it's fine. Um, yeah. It's different. It's I don't want to say they're going backwards because yet they're maturing, but then the sound harkens back to like a previous time. Well, and, if you listen, was it moments in time? And I think there's a line that he says something about they lost their way. So it leads me to believe that they're wanting to go back a little bit on their sound because they they kind of and that's why they broke up they they lost i think inviting or whatever i don't know but they lost well, their way think and, about it they kind of had a pseudo hit from the previous record you yeah. know sold me down the river kind of a pseudo hit what it just hit the top 40 and these guys kept selling less and less and less yeah. these guys can't make a living i don't know exactly what they did quite after but they probably went back and found day jobs um but really this catalog's very strong yes they progress it's way different yep. each record showcases something else um it shows a natural evolution of the band let's say that right. yep. they, have, they blend a lot of different styles you know 
what we talked about, social, political issues. Um, but I will say this. I, I'd say that Stan, Declaration, those records are very similar. But as you go through the catalog, a lot of these records uh, are very unique. And I think they stand yeah. up by themselves. Yep. Does that, I if will, that makes any sense. Yeah. I will say with five albums, there's not too many bands you can say that there's not a bad album in the bunch. Oh, there's not a bad album at all. Yeah. Just yeah. different, different Just levels different. of preferences of what you like uh, and stuff. So it's, there's not too many bands I can say that I, the, in the IRS here, I haven't really, they, he came back, Mike Peters in 2002, I think, or somewhere. He's put out a ton of music in the last 20 years, a ton of music. And I can't even get caught up on it. But that's and a totally is, different band too. It it's is a, a totally, totally different, different band, but I've heard is fantastic, mm -hmm. but it's this era that is like precious for me. It's this, it, these guys mean a lot to me because I really got into them and I was, none of my friends were into them. It was, this was my band right. and I loved them for, well, I can't say change. I did say change. I didn't, see that album when it came out but mm -hmm. those first three albums man i just lived them so i really did like them right no. well you know i think they're a good band if you haven't heard anything like this you like uh, new wave i'm going to put them in new wave though they really that's where they go I think. as they go through their catalog because new wave only really went up to 84 but those early records the ep stand yeah i think it's not. you know Marching on, yes, all that declaration. I put that it all in the new wave, right? Um, so since we're keeping it loose, how would you, if you had to rank them, how would you rank them? If you're trying um, to turn someone on to it, okay, let me do this, let me backpedal, okay, John. If you're turning someone on to this band, where should they start out? For me, if I'm telling someone the strength is the album that hooked me in. From I mean, and I've been a fan since. So that album with six, not 68 Guns, but wrong album. <laughs> but with Strength and Knife right. Edge, um, Spirit of 76, the anthems are huge. The slower songs like uh, The Day the Ravens Left the Tower, which I said is my favorite. That's what I want people to hear because to me that is, that's the essence of them. And then you go to Declaration. Okay. Then maybe to Changes then i have the hurricane and then raw Ooh. so Ooh. yeah so raw would be my i'm gonna say least favorite because i'm not gonna say i don't like it well i don't dislike it yeah i don't dislike it it's just i'm not gonna pick it up like i do the other ones i got it if you're gonna yeah. get in if you're looking at this catalog well i think you're right get get the uh greatest hits see if that's up your alley um, but I would not start out with raw. That's my number five. Uh, I go raw. It's kind of going right through the years. Are you going back? My number four, uh, my number three is eye of the hurricane. Uh, strength is number two and uh declaration is number one, 1984. That's the way I like them. Yeah. But, I'm just a little, okay. I just a couple. You gotta rank them somewhere, but there's really not that much. How do I want to put it? For me, there's hardly any difference. It's nitpicking. One and two. Yeah, right. Those could you could take all those. I could tracks flip on one there. and two for me any day. Exactly. I can flip three and four any day. Right. Five will probably always be my five, but it's still a good album. It's there's still a good album. Songs. Yes. Yeah. So do I think that's good. look for standards. Yeah. Then dive into the first or second album if you like that, and then go out from there. The IRS years are it's a it's a small catalog. Yeah. Now, if you liked everything there, you know Mike Peters. The catalog after this era is, is vast. I is can't talk vast. about it. Yeah. I'm just talking about the original. We're just talking about yeah. the original band. So I think he's putting out an, like an album a year right now. Well, good for him. Yeah, and it's like, quality. It's quality. Like Neil Young. I think he puts one out every five months or four well, months. Well, he might. <laughs> and there are live shows, this and live that. Yeah. <laughs> that archival series keeps him busy. Yeah. yeah. But anyway, either way, 
this is a band we thought you want to hear about. And it's just about turning people onto music. So that's all Mike. That's all. That's Mike Peters. Absolutely brilliant. Brilliant. If you want to check out some of his other material, go ahead. If you, hey, in fact, we're, John and I are very open to stuff. If you are familiar with his solo material or the other alarm stuff or whatever Mike has done, tell us down in the uh, comments. Absolutely. We want to hear from you because it's all about, like we said, I keep repeating myself, <laughs> it's all about talking music. So we want to keep it interactive in the chat. So just let us know. Let us know how you would rank this catalog. Let us know what you like and what you don't like. We want to hear it all. So uh, there you go. So, uh, John, is there anything you want to uh, touch on before we wrap this dog up? Well, no. Thank you for having me. Um, but if they do want to go check out Too Loud, Too Old Music on YouTube or on a dot .com as well, uh, it'd be great. Click subscribe and i do a show a week and now i'm actually going to start doing two a week um so yeah come check it out we just it's basically called half the show's called the collection and we're going through my collection and then the other show i do episode i do during the week is just reviewing a a retro album and awesome. i think i've got one coming up um the first two are going to be um george harrison's all things must pass mm -hmm. and then i'm doing frank zappa's hot rats so yeah <laughs> there you go ladies and gentlemen yeah. so check out his channel please like subscribe uh give uh john some love over there um for me please like subscribe here if you're new if you're an alarm fan we want to hear from you if you're not yeah. check out the catalog leave a comment like we said uh what's next in the warehouse probably this this is kind of a light week for me so there's a lot going on the contrarians check it out we will be live i don't know when this is coming out but don't forget to turn into the contrarians wednesdays at uh, 7 p.m we usually do a live show martin will be there martin is back he's been he's, gone a couple weeks well yeah. he was on business he was yeah. on business he's back so check that out um and check out uh, john's channel based on that let's wrap it up Listen to some alarm and let us know how you feel. All right, everybody. Have a good one and uh, keep it real. Keep it clean. <laughs>